in the previous lecture we discussed the basics of subfertility, epidemiology and the history taken and examination. Today we are going to cover male uh, investigations and some of the treatments for male infertility as well as investigation of the female partner. In the next lecture we will cover the management of the female patient with uh, additional uh, facts on the reproductive assisted reproductive technology and other treatment for unexplained infertility. So, in the uh, investigation of the uh, male partner, the initial investigation is his taking an examination and you try to identify any uh, abnormality and then direct your uh, investigational path based on them. But as a routine part uh, step, everybody should have a semen analysis. Uh, as a doctor, you should know how to advise your patients to collect a sample of semen analysis for semen analysis and if one report comes as abnormal, you need to make sure that you repeat it after two to three months. Uh, once the semen analysis is normal, we generally don't focus too much on the male part unless we come across something else later, then the focus will shift to the female evaluation. But if the female is also by tubal factor assessment and ovulation assessment looks normal, then we might reconsider going back to the male part because then they will come into this category called unexplained infertility. In that situation, we might focus on the male again to see whether there are anti-sperm antibodies, DNA integrity problems of the sperm, whether the sperm has the ability to penetrate the zona pellucida and we can assess them with various assays. So those techniques are available for evaluation of the male partner if female is also normal and they belong to the unexplained fertility category. But majority of the females will have some functional abnormality and then we focus mainly on improving and correcting the female partner. Now we come to the abnormal seminal analysis. Now, after you repeat uh, seminal analysis, if you find it as abnormal, then you obviously you will correct certain factors by lifestyle modification and uh, other general advice. And then you need to exclude any toxins to the gonads or things which impair the spermatogenesis like drugs, exercise and everything. So, that we will talk about them in a minute and that has to be done and then again a repeat SFA has to be done to see whether it is improved. If it is improved again you go back to the female part. Suppose your abnormal SFA does not improve with your simple measures then obviously you need to think about further clarification and classification of the male partner seminal analysis. At the same time you perform the basic endocrinological assessment of the male partner as well and then take everything together in your management. The, the seminal analysis report can be classified into three or four, uh, three types of general abnormalities. You can have low volume problems, you can have a zoospermic patients who doesn't have any sperm or you will have oligoasthenoteratospermia. That means oligo means low counts, asthenol means low motility, terato means abnormal morphology. So those categories need separate assessment. First, we will come back to our seminal fluid analysis. We need to make sure that seminal fluid is not 
the best indicator or the true measure of fertility. There can be people who have perfect normal SFAs but still cannot achieve pregnancy. But on the other hand, you cannot exclude, uh, completely write that off. It, even though it is not the best measure, it indicates the chance of having a pregnancy. So, if it is abnormal, then it obviously shows that you have a lower chance of achieving a pregnancy. The individual parameters, morphology, mortality, the volume separately or taken together, thus only that. Individual parameters alone may not indicate any specific, particularly specific abnormality. Sometimes we manage them thinking that way, but still they are not that predictive in the, for the underlying cause. If one sample is abnormal, as I said earlier, you need to repeat it in three months because sperm takes roughly 60 to 80 days, so 60 to 72 days. The range is between somewhere around 40 to about 80. So this is a sample uh, experiment where they have given radio labeled uh, water, deuterium water to the males and then try to detect that in the seminal fluid. So there wasn't anything in until about 40 days and then gradually it increases but the maximal values are reached around 60 days to 70 days and after that it again decreases. So, so roughly a sperm takes about 60 to 80 days to be produced. So if someone is abnormal that says that you, there had been some influence with the seminal fluid production 60 days before. So, if you are suspicious, repeat it after another 60 days to see, get a new batch of semen from the testes. If that is also abnormal, then you can come to a conclusion. So, a single SFA is not a valid uh, thing to base your treatment. The general advice is to abstain from intercourse or ejaculation for three to five days, collect it in a wide mouth, screw capped, medical uh, special container which is free of plastics and uh, other various uh, gonadotoxic chem uh, chemicals. Ideally, it has to be a glass, special medical grade glass. If even if it is a plastic container, it should not be a yogurt cup or in just any cup. That cup should not have it's a medical grade cup, it does not elude any chemicals into the same in the sample. Otherwise, your sample will get influenced by the chemicals which are leaching from the plastics. So you, know, you need to get the proper collecting tubes. So because of the wide variation and because of the influence of the time duration, we generally repeat two samples before committing. Ideally, that sample has to be obtained in the lab. So, you are advised to go to our seminal fluid uh, processing uh, session and you will see how it is done, how the advices are given and the information leaflet about seminal fluid collection which are given to the prospective patients uh, and as a doctor you need to know and then they are generally if they cannot take the sample in the lab in the artificial environment some people do then we encourage them to bring it from home within one hour of ejaculation but when they are bringing it they need to carry it in the trouser pocket at the body temperature uh, as much as possible and reach the lab within one hour because if you take more than one hour, it will affect the sperm motility and other parameters. Some people see even with that they cannot. In those cases, we might ask them to have normal intercourse with the non-lubricated condoms. Unfortunately, the most of the condoms which are available in the market are lubricated and all these lubricants contain a spermicidal. Uh, some of them have spermicides on it and even the lubricant since it's 
they are oil based might impair the the sperm motility because of that we don't advise using the normal condoms there has to be special non lubricated condoms as we mentioned earlier the seminal parameters are only an indicator of the fecundity or your ability to produce a live birth or a pregnancy within one cycle but it does not uh, it's not a indicator of the in the infertility of but it's just uh, in important contributor so when you have a report after seminal fluid analysis from the lab these are the parameters which you need to look into these are based on the 2010 who reference manual of seminal analysis of the fifth edition this is 2010 uh, values don't go by any other values which are given in the report some of the labs have still not updated but all the previous uh, criteria of normality are no longer valid the volume has to be 1.5 ml or more so if the volume is low you need to follow the path of a uh, low volume SFA. the concentration we used to have a higher target uh, normal value earlier in earlier uh, reference ranges but nowadays what we consider is 15 million total count is around 39 million or more mortality has to be 40 percent progressive mortality or type a mortality type a mortality has to be at least 32 percent the morphology has to be four percent and viability has to be that means viable sperm has to be at least 15 percent there shouldn't be any agglutination and white cell should be less than 1 million per ml those are the parameters which you need to go by and if that is abnormal we target various interventions for the The initial investigations of uh, uh, treatments of a male partner includes after SFA, if it is abnormal, slightly abnormal, general session or general advice. We will be talking about timing of intercourse to them and avoiding wet heat, which is steam or hot tubs or NAS and other things and other radiation exposures, chemical exposures, especially if it is a farmer or a technician who handles chemicals and chemical vapors who are exposed to heavy heat like a cook majority of the time, we will advise even the stress of lifestyle and heavy work or breaking sleep all the time all these factors are all important in improving the seminal fluid so you need to take time and advise your patients about these things and as a first contact doctor you are the best person to do that then if they are using some people still uh, continue to use called lubricants to facilitate intercourse if they are using that and uh, then it has to be uh, stress to them that they need to avoid common lubricants like surgery lobe or KY jelly or some people have the habit of using saliva for lubrication they are all bad for seminal fluid if they really want to use ask them to use vegetable oils mainly canola oil or even raw, raw egg white as they are not damaging to the sperm actually the raw egg white was used in many of the sperm culture preparations initially until very recently when before the dent of all these brand named products they have been part of the seminal fluid culture uh, formulas and then we need to look at their history again and if they are on any sort of androgenic or kind of a steroids that has to be stopped 
you can uh, probably guess why it is because all these steroids will impair their FSH LH testosterone axis. So anybody who is taking androgens to build up their body mass actually are damaging their seminal fluid uh, counts because though the muscle mass builds up your actual vitality goes down. So steroids are generally androgenic steroids are testosterone, testosterone uh, derivatives are all bad for your seminal fluid. So you may be a hulk like person but you will never father a child. If as obesity is important in seminal fluid function always advise them to lose their weight and reduce their weight. There are certain special sports like cycling which needs to be which needs to be stopped because cycling though it's a good uh, physical activity can have be damaging to your seminal fluid counts. Somebody who is uh, regularly doing cycling can have urinary symptoms due to repeated trauma of the bladder as well as trauma to the scrotum and high temperatures associated with continuous cycling. So they will have prostatitis, pelvic numbness and impair the counts due to the high heat of the scrotum. So that has to be advised to be stopped and uh, after all these lifestyle changes you repeat another SFA and see whether the uh, parameters are improved. If none of those uh, initial in, uh, interventions are successful obviously you need to think about endocrine assessment as well as classify the male partner based on the count and the volume into low volume or oligosuspermia or azospermia categories and then target your management based on that. General second line hormonal assays are FSH, LH, testosterone which has to be done in the morning and pregnancy. Most of the time what we initially do is a FSH value and a morning testosterone value. If that is abnormal we go for LH and prolactins. People with erectile dysfunction will get the prolactin in the first round. So based on your history you might change the, the, the test which you are going to do because prolactin is associated with erectile dysfunction. So if somebody has eracteria, gynecomastia, erectile dysfunction by your all means before doing even FSH you should do a prolactin. Generally, we we don't offer these tests for everybody, but if the sperm counts are less than 10 million or any clinical signs like gynecomastia or signs of very small testes with hypogonadism, lack of facial hair, lack of male uh, secondary sexual characteristics or somebody with say tall stature suggesting that they are having client filters, we might do this as hormones as part of the assessment. So any signs of any endocrine dysfunction, do the hormonal assays. After these tests, most of the time we, may, we generally don't manage them alone. We become a team with the urological and endoc endocrine team in managing most of the male partners. So some of the things which I will be talking, we are not really done by the gynecologist. It's done by a team consisting of gynecology, endocrinology, as well as uh, urological team. Because it involves multiple specialties and multiple expertise. So that then we move into higher end things. But as a doctor, you should have some idea what are being done to these patients. That is why we are going to talk on them. But that doesn't mean that you need, will be tested or you will be uh, asked to answer or manage these patients. Generally, if SFA is abnormal, it is beyond uh, uh, normal doctors, MBBS doctors abilities and generally they have to be handed over to a specialist center. So, we have hormonal prop up 
profile abnormalities. This table will show you the common abnormalities which we see in the male partner. So if somebody is normal, they will have normal FSH, normal testosterone, NLH and prolactin. People who do have lack of sperm production due to primarily testicular problem, primary testicular failures, they will have normal or low testosterone depending on the damage to the Leydig cells which produce the testosterone which are in between the sperm uh, uh, seminiferous tubules on the interstitium of the testes. So some, sometimes testosterone may be there, it may, may be abnormal. FSH invariably will be high because it is not being inhibited. LH will be normal or high depending on the cause. Prolactin is generally normal. There are male patients who have maturation arrest, but they, here they produce in the seminiferous tubules. In the, the, you will see the evidence of spermatogenesis, but you will not see the mature sperms or uh, type B spermatocytes. Those are those people have what is called maturation arrest. Their sperm production continues, but it will stop at the point beyond before the normal level. So they have a problem with the maturation of the sperm. In those cases, the testosterone, FSH, LH is like a normal person. At the same time, if you have a blockage in the duct, again all these values will be normal. So most of the time, we use this hormonal test as a kind of a initial assessment whether this is non-obstructive or obstructive is If it is obstructive, usually FSH, LA, testosterone are normal. Then you have another condition called Sertoli cells only. In this case, there are no spermatogonia in the Sertoli cells. You know that Sertoli cells are the, the, the scaffolding or the mother cells which look after our spermatogonia and spermatogonia and go and implant on the holes or crypts of the Sertoli cells and if spermatogonia doesn't arrive in the testis in, in its embryonic development you will have only Sertoli cells without any spermatogonia and you will not have any testosterone production if it will be very high LH will be high normal prolactin since it is from the pituitary will be normal Another category of uh, male infertile people will be hypogonadotropic hypogonadotropic, which is the problem with the higher centers of the pituitary and hypothalamus. Here, because of lack of stimulation from the pituitary, you will have less low testosterone, low FSH, obviously, from, not from, since it is not coming from the pituitary, LH will be also low. Product may be normal or abnormal because the difference effect of these path underlying pathologies, sometimes prolactin may be normal. People with hyperprolactinemia, testosterone will be low because it has a direct effect on production of testosterone. If it will be normal, low, low, LH will be low usually. Prolactin is obviously high most of the time over 1000, not hundreds, 200, 300. It will be very high values. People with Kleinfelter syndrome, again, they are hypogonadic. They will not have testosterone, FSH, BI, LH is high, prolactin is normal. So these are the common uh, classification based on the endocrine assessment. You can see it's both systems are there. But since we are focusing mainly on the male factor, you can see that all these end organs, the testes, will have effect on the hypothalamus and pituitary on negative fashion, negative feedback fashion, and that will impair their sperm production. That is why it is based on this only. We advise that androgens should not be used in treating the male subfertility because you will be suppressing the hypothalamus and pituitary 
plants and they in turn will be reducing the phase outflow from the pituitary to effect the sperm production. Now, we will come to the uh, based on our previous chart to the people who have low seminal volumes. When you are seeing a seminal fluid assessment report in the OSCE examination, we will be giving you various uh, reports for you to assess and comment and plan the management. If you have low seminal fluid volume, first thing which you need to check is whether the technique had been followed correctly. Some people, however you advise, fail to collect the sample correctly. When they are collecting the seminal fluid, they may not direct the, the penile outflow into the container properly, so it would have spilt out. You need to ask them and verify. So, when you are taking a sample from from a patient in the lab also, there should be a format for the lab technician to check whether the total sample had been collected or whether there had been any spill. If it had been spilled and some estimate of that as well or if the volume is very low, you need to repeat it. Ask whether there had been any problems with the ejaculation. Some people have a habit of not ejaculating everything out. They have retrograde ejaculation, especially if diabetics or people who are on various uh, and uh, beta blockers, they tend to have uh, retrograde ejaculation. So, without same and without coming into outside, will go back to the bladder. There are people who do not ejaculate at all and ejaculation because of stress or neuronal damage, or say, especially after trauma or accidents into the lower. Uh, spine, part of the spine or parts of the brain, people will have an ejaculation. In those cases, you need to uh, have various other mechanisms to get electro ejaculation done. So, there are various electrical gadgets which you, by vibrating the penile urethra produces the sample. Or sometimes you stimulate the, the bulbocavernosus muscle with elect small electrical impulses to get electrical ejaculation done. So, there are various additional techniques and most of these things are handled by the urological colleagues of ours. So, we send them to these patients for urological assessment and treatment to get the sample. Sometimes when they fail that, we go directly to the testis and take a sample. That is a different matter we will talk about later. If the person uh, is having a low signal value, again check whether the secondary sexual characteristics, testicular volume are normal and the consistency of the testis is normal. We examine him whether you, if you have missed anything in the previous assessment of the male to see whether they have hypogonadism features. Hypogonadism means signs of lack of test male hormones. Then there may be people who have problems with obstruction of ejaculated duct, people with prostatic infections, prostatitis, people with benign prostatic hypertrophy, they may have blockage of the ejaculated duct from the seminal vesicles into the prostatic urethra. We know that prostatic urethra is the place where seminal pathway cross meets the urinary path. So, if that is abnormal, we can get some idea from the SFA. If your seminal fluid sample has a pH very acidic, less than 7, that means seminal fluid is not coming from the seminal vesicle. Because we know seminal vesicles can make the, uh, the seminal fluid alkaline by its product. Seminal fluid products are alkaline. If the pH is less than 7, that means it is acidic. So, there is no contribution from seminal vesicles. At the same time, fructose is added to the semen from the seminal vesicles. If fructose is absent, again you can check the seminal fluid to fructose. If that is also abnormal, that means ducts are blocked. You can get additional uh, information by transrectal ultrasound or PR examination, you might be able to palpate the enlarged or blocked seminal vesicles or uh, 
transrectal ultrasound and additional endocrine testing or even post ejaculatory UFR to see whether the sperm is there to detect in retrograde ejaculation. Especially in diabetics this happens. Sometimes we check the sperm in the urine and then we take that urine uh, by filling the bladder with the catheter of a culture media and then we get them to urinate and take the sperm from the urine and then take the sperm, extract them and do IUI in those patients. Occasionally people with low volume will usually be diagnosed this early by palpating the vasculitis but if they have low volume again re-examine them whether you have missed a bilateral absence of vasculitis which is usually due to cystic fibrosis. We don't have it commonly in this country but in Western countries in certain populations like Jews, it is fairly high because they carry the gene mutation mostly. Uh, but even in this country, there are patients, so you need to check whether they have vast difference in the spermatic cord. So this is the summary of the algorithm or the protocol which we use. We check the volume, repeat the same analysis. If it, the collection is income impaired, repeat it. If not, see whether the vast difference is there. If it is not congenital absent vast difference, then you go for endocrine assessment, like the previous table where we have all the abnormalities. See whether the testosterone is normal. If it is low, then they have hypogonadism. Again, the further endocrine assessment. And then if testosterone and other hormones are normal, then probably it is due to retrograde ejaculation. Do a UFR and see whether the sperm is there, then if it is there, it's retrograde ejaculation. So you need to do give them sympathomimetics, correct diabetes and IUI with culture media. If UFR after ejaculation is negative, then check whether the prostate and seminal vesicles are enlarged. If it is abnormally enlarged, you need to do a transrectal ultrasound guided aspiration and see whether the semen is there. If that is there, then the ejaculated duct is obstructed. Then obviously urology referral needs to be done. They can do a trans urethral dissection of the ejaculatory duct or cannulation. If it is also negative, you can't see any vis seminal vesicle blockage, then probably ejaculatory duct is ob obstructed inside the prosthetic part of the ejaculatory duct or epididymis may be obstructed. In those cases, we may have to do sperm extraction procedures. So basically, you under uh, local anesthesia, you can inject or sometimes under ultrasound guided guidance and de detect whether the epidemic is enlarged if there's a block or blockage in the vast difference and aspirate sperms or even testicular aspiration. Those are the techniques which we have for people uh, with blocked path. In those cases, that has to be done generally in a fertility lab where you have the ability to freeze sperms or cryopreserve them so that any extraction products can be cryopreserved and the male can be helped with the IVF procedure or ICSI procedure, which we will talk later. If ultrasound is normal, there are no signs of any seminal vesicle block, probably he is not ejaculating. So these are the people with an ejaculation and sometimes they need help with electro ejaculation. So they can be helped with again with the urological techniques. Then the next are seminal fluid abnormality, oligosuspermia, asthenosuspermia, or teratosuspermia, depending on the count or the concentration, motility and morphology. Mild abnormalities from 15 million to 10 million generally are 
easy to correct by the lifestyle modification. We really take them as oligosuspermia when the counts are less than 10 million. And when it is less than 5 million, they are called severe oligosuspermia. Most of the time, the underlying endocrine disorders, dental tract infections, antisperm antibodies, prominent varicocytes, various genetical abnormalities like Klinefelter's, Nounan syndrome and so many things are there, uh, which impair the sperm production and impair the concentration. Exposure of chemicals, pesticides, radiation, stress, all that contribute to them. So your lifestyle modification has to go another round in this type of situation. And if you see uh, on the SFA past cells more than 1 million, it has to be less than 1 million per ml. If it is there, you need to do a seminal culture. And when you are doing seminal culture, you need to do a PR and do a good prostate massage before the sample is taken. And if it is culture positive, always treat them for at least one month. And generally, it is safer for you to refer this patient for urological assessment as well to see whether there is any other additional accessory gland infection or proselytitis which needs further assessment and treatment. Sometimes you might do urethral cultures for mycoplasma and chlamydia as well and treat them with doxycycline, metronidazole combination. People with astenosuspermia usually we don't intervene. Most of the time, we cannot do much, but if it is severe, very uh, low motility, sometimes they have what is called anti-sperm antibodies. So, they, they produce antibodies against their sperm and those antibodies will make the sperm motility low. Usually, it happens when you have testicular injuries, torsions or chitis or any biopsy procedures or direct interventions to test this where you break the blood testicular barrier or even in uh, testicular cancers. So, these are common conditions which trigger off anti-sperm antibodies and if you suspect you need to do various additional sperm motility testing uh, to detect that. And the treatment is usually intrauterine insemination where you don't really need the semen to be that more time. You can take a sample, wash them and then directly inject it into the, the uterine cavity or go for IVF or intracytoplasmic sperm injection XC procedures of uh, reproductive technology are available for this type of people and it's because of the availability of easy treatments, we don't generally go behind anti-sperm antibodies. People with severe oligosuspermia usually are almost like having esospermia. And what you need to uh, make sure is that it is not uh, due to various genetic causes of esospermia like chromosomal abnormalities, Klein's Merita syndrome or uh, cystic fibrosis like another single gene mutation. If those are there, usually they will have oligosuspermia or esospermia depending on the degree of damage the seminal uh, 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 producing mechanism uh, they will have low depending on various counts so depending on the count you treat but generally you think about genetics if the seminal damage is considered like radiation or chemical exposure you can do various tests for DNA fragmentation. Uh, we don't perform them routinely, but if the male is severely oligosuspermic or having uh, trouble with recurrent miscarriages, we might think of offering these tests. And uh, androgenic andro, 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 andrology labs, we tend to do this. And most of the time, it, they are done in combination with IVF procedures or, or additional reproductive procedures. So, this summarizes everything uh, with the seminal fluid. You have astenosuspermia, teratosuspermia, oligosuspermia. So, if the oligosuspermia is there, recheck the androgens. If the androgen deficiency is there, you need to treat them with 
selective estrogen receptor modulators like clomiphene or other tests combination of clomiphene and testosterone, uh, dexamethasone and other tests. If androgens are normal, then you check about genetic testing, karyotyping and Y micro deletions and then think of donor insemination, no assisted reproductive sex surgeries, procedures. If uh, genetic testing is negative, if it is a varicocele only, you treat. If none of the var no varicocele is detected, again, accessory reproductive technologies are the answer. People with abnormal teratosis permea again see whether they have varicoceles or whether they have chemical exposure, remove them, treat them or if not go for assisted reproductive technology. You can see that ARTs or assisted technologies are the treatment for most of the severe forms of male factor. Same here with astronosis permea check whether they have infections, treat them with culture, see whether the possibility of antisperm antibodies are there. Treatment is usually ART. For antisperm, antisperm antibody negative patients, again check whether seminal vesicles are blocked, ejaculated ducts are blocked. Again treatment is usually ART. Lifestyle modifications and other things need to be added, but generally Ultimately, here assisted technologies are the answer. People with the severe azospermia usually due to obstructive reasons or non obstructive reasons, which are testicular most of the time, treatment is assisted reproduction. I will not go into detail, but you can freshly look at the, the chart which is there available in the Moodle as a slideshow as well as in this video where you can work out itself. Remember, we don't expect you to know into go, all these details about other things. For the completion, I have given this information, but generally we don't test them to that extent. But have some idea about things which can cause azospermia without obstruction. People with obstructive azospermia is due to ductal obstruction or ejaculated duct obstruction. That is a different story. Here, the problem is with the testis primary testicular failures. You can have idiopathic primary testicular failures. You can have people with Y chromosome. We know Y chromosome is the main determinant of sex uh, testis. So if there are micro deletions of the Y chromosome, you might end up having various abnormalities. Kleinfelter syndrome is one example, but where are, there are so many other translocations syndromes like Noonan syndrome, Coleman syndrome, all of them will have uh, impairment of the sperm production. Severe hyperprolactinemia, any tumor in the hypothalamic pituitary area, severe varicocele, childhood cancer treatment, leukemia treatment, radiotherapy treatments, they will directly affect the, the testes. Various anabolic steroids, alcohols, generally they are seen in adults, undiagnosed congenital adrenal hyperplasia, various systemic illnesses, long term treatment for cancers or renal failures, undiagnosed cryptorganism, which expose the testes for higher temperatures in the abdominal low groin area, it can damage the uh, sperm production or seminal uh, tubules and autoimmune uh, antisperm antibodies or chemical or pesticide exposure. All these things sometimes can be modified or can be diagnosed early enough. So, as a doctor, you should have some idea that males can get damage, not only the female. So, when you are having a young person, always think about their fertility in the back of your mind. If you are handling them, See whether if any of my treatment can impair their future fertility. Whatever field uh, you practice later, keep that in the back of your mind. General management of male fertility is as always, as I stressed several times, lifestyle modification. If low testosterone is seen, we usually treat them with 
so selective estrogen receptor module builders rather than gonadotropin uh, testosterone. We don't give testosterone because it is limpia and hypothalamus built into the axis directly. So we give a direct sim uh, indirect similar to testosterone production in the way of comifene, tamoxifen, plus or minus dexamethasone, or directly with gonadotropin or even GNR. Pulse type. You can give generic impulses from uh, pumps, which can be carried on your pocket. People with high estrogen, sometimes people have high estrogens, you need to suppress that with aromatase inhibitors. People with ejaculated dysfunction, I told you that we will either offer them a UI or refer them to surgical. People with an ejaculation, you need electrical vibratory stimulation but please make sure that you exclude any neurological damage so refer them to neurology team as well as urology team both these teams need to see these patients people with ejaculated duct obstructions IUI Pyospermia or infections, treat them and then repeat SFA and stream. Antisperms, IVF, IUIs, and other procedures. Varicoses is surgery, obstructive azospermia you can do if it is in the vast difference. A urologic can correct them. You can do a reconstruction like this. You can remove the damaged part and then Reanastomos the first difference. And it has a fairly good chance. So this is somebody who has ejaculated duct obstruction. Seminal vesicle is enlarged. You go through the urethra and then you can recanalize. There are certain disadvantages uh, of this. You can dilate it with a small balloon or a stent, or you can do a resection. If the varicoceles are there, you can do various microsurgical varicocele repairs or varicocele uh, resections without damaging the rest of the spermatic cord. You can do them and outcomes are good. But if the, the testis is not producing sperm, you can do a testicular seminal uh, extraction procedures or TESI. Sperm extraction procedure, basically you do a various uh, dissection of the testis and then the, since the atrophic seminiferous tubules are small, those seminiferous tubules which are producing te, uh, sperms are easily picked up because they are distended and you can put a small fine needle or micropipette and aspirate them. and usually we do them in the, under anesthesia in the theatre and the sample is taken straight away for seminal uh, pre pre preservation cryopreservation. So overall depending on your sperm count we de decide on the type of intervention we have. If the counts are above 40 million, if the counts are normal you generally go for in IUI or in intercourse. If counts are between 5 million and 40 million IUI is the treatment of choice. 5 million to 500,000 IVF generally the classical normal IVF can be helpful. But when the counts are below 500,000 or 0.5 million or less, you go for intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is an advanced form of assisted reproduction where you can get a pregnancy even with one spermatid, not sperm, spermatid, a premature sperm can still. And this is the general algorithm which summarizes everything which we talked earlier. Uh, you can look at them pleasure. Now we come to the last part of the assessment. We'll go into the investigations of female. Generally, female uh, investigations go into two groups. General investigations like checking for rubella antibodies, HIV, hepatitis B, varicella screening full blood count, pap smears, HVS, those are the things which you do and generally anybody who is embarking on a pregnancy. 
taking their BMI, advising all that will be done with this. Then we come to the specific uh, investigations. There are two specific investigations which we are doing everybody. One is to see whether they are ovulating, where we use basal body temperature, urinary latch kits, or middle luteal progesterone, so transvaginal scanning, depending on the need, we do those tests. Then you have tubal patency assessment. You can do HSGs, laparoscopy, and chromotubation or dye test, sonohistrography, saline sonohistrography. So, some, in some countries, instead of them, they do chlamydia antibodies test CAT because of the high incidence of chlamydia and chlamydia being very important in uh, tubal blockage. If you have high chlamydia tests, there's no point taking your tubes. It's already damaged. You don't need to. So if chlamydia antibody prevalence is high, chlamydia prevalence is high, we might as well disregard HSGs and lap and die straight away do chlamydia. So in countries like uh, Denmark, Sweden and uh, Netherlands, they do chlamydia antibody instead of HSGs or laparoscopy. Then, if the female partner is older, we might do antral, uh, say, test for ovarian reserve, antral follicle count, or antimalarian hormone. Diagnostic hysteroscopies and laparoscopies are done when we have a complicated pelvic issue like fibroids, or endometriosis, or tubal damage, or PID. In those cases, these invasive procedures are done. So, that's the general overview outline. And this slide, uh, we are not going into detail because it has investigations as well as a diagnosis. But you can see the things which we do. Progesterones, HSGs, laparoscopies. Depending on the, the problem, ignore this part which we are not interested in because we have tackled that. So depending on the patient's past history, uh, menstrual history and uh, other things, we choose dif different examinations or investigations. Right? People with irregular periods, we do hormonal assays, antimalarian hormones. People with uh, pe painful periods, so straight away we go for laparoscopies and endometriosis assessment. People with previous high tuberculosis prevalence area or HIV or PID, again, we check their endometrius, endometrium to see whether the tuberculosis has been damaging their endometrium. Transvaginal scanning, laparoscopy may be the investigation. So depending on your history, you might decide the test to offer. So to come to routine testing, which we do in those without any clinical background, then we do mid-luteal testing, HSGU or saline sonography. So, if we go the normal path, eh, the first test which we can do is uh, basal body temperature. But remember in the back of your mind, none of these uh, tests can detect the quality of those. It can detect that, so whether you are ovulating or not. But even if you ovulate or not, sometimes you may not really be fertile. So, the function cannot be tested. Only the presence of the or absence of the ovulation can be tested in most of these tests. You can have uh, basal body temperature charts. You can do urinary LH surge detection, mid-luteal progesterones, and transvaginal scan. If you have regular menstruation, that history alone is enough in most of the patients. About 90% of them will be regularly ovulating if they have <coughs> regular menses. Basal body temperature, we used to do them, it's tedious, you need to do them in the first thing in the morning and you need to carry a thermometer, take it into the mouth, keep it for two minutes and then to get the temperature. Problem is, though it is involves a lot of effort, the method is very subjective, difficult to interpret. In, and even if it is... Uh, good in the first cycle or so, people tend to lose their interest. So, long run it is difficult to maintain. And some people with a very short luteal phase, 
you may not detect it. Uh, you can see at the time of ovulation the temperature increases by about half a degree of centigrade 97 97.9 98. So, 0.5 degree centigrade difference is there between the pre ovulate and ovulate period. So, depending on your fert, uh, fertile days, usually after detecting ovulation based on the, the basal body temperature chart, actually two of your previous fertile days have already gone by the time you notice it. You have got another one or two days of fertile period because generally the best fertile, fertile period is two days prior to ovulation and another one or two days afterwards because after releasing the ova has to be fertilized within 24 hours. But the sperm can last in the genital tract for three days or 72 hours. So if the sperm is there within that 24 hour period you can start timing your intercourse about two days prior to ovulation and then you have additional one day of uh, overlap between the two. So, if you are targeting that you need to start two days back. So, urinary uh, sorry basal body temperature based uh, timing of intercourse is not a good idea. Seminal uh, serum progesterone assay is uh, the mainstay of our assessment. We generally do it on the 21st day but it does not really need to be done only on that day. Depending on your cycle length, you can take it. So, if your cycle is 20, 35 days, you need to do the mid luteal progesterone on 28th day. If your cycle is 21 days, you need to do it on the 14th day. So, depending on your cycle length you target, any value of more than 3 nanograms is generally a good sign of the ovulation, but always follow the lab standards don't go with these values but if the values are low that means the foliar ovulation is not occurring some problem is there and when you have high values of progesterone it only tells you that ovulation has occurred at a particular time in the cycle but it does not tell you when it has it is coming so it is not a good uh, test to say when you are going to ovulate it always checks after the fact after the thing has happened so it's not uh, valid val very valuable in predicting your future ovulation that is why we use transvaginal scanning because transvaginal scanning can show you the developing follicle clearly so when you are treating we go for this we assess ovulation or previous ovulation by progesterone, but we don't use it in treatment cycles. Doing a single isolated uh, progesterone value is not a very good idea because what we are really after is to see whether the luteal function of the follicle is happening. Progesterone is not something which is continuously produced. It is produced in pulsatile manner. So, in even in a person who is ovulating, progesterone value may vary depending on the timing of your sample. So, it is not a very uh, valuable testing to see whether you are really ovulating. It can miss. So, from one moment to another, there can be a eight fold or eight times change of the concentration. So, you, if you miss the peak, you will not see effects of progesterone. So, timing has to be perfect. And then, even in fertile period of people with ovulation, the values may be sometimes low. So, some there may be a person who has a very low, almost abnormal. The progesterone value but still they are fertile. So, the concentration between normal cycle and non conception cycle and conception cycle is there is overlap values are not that 
indicative of the ability to ovulate. Because of that natural variation, basing all your judgments on a single progesterone sample is not a good idea. So even if the, the progesterone is abnormal, you still treat them in the same way. Now we have urinary LH surge checking. You have various kits on the market. If the LH surge is there, you will see like in a pregnancy test, you will see double lines. And it has to be done in the morning, generally, because then you have the most concentrated urine overnight. And the advantage of this is that it can give you an indication of if you do it regularly, it can pick your ovulation. Because the surge occurs about two to three days before the ovulation, or at least 48 hours before the ovulation. So if you are being warned about the future ovulation, so it has that advantage. And people who are timing their intercourse or who have difficulty in finding their partner on a particular time, this gives an additional advantage. So if you detect the surge, you have at least 24 for, for so hours or so for your intercourse to time and that gives an advantage and control for some women. But because of the abnormalities of LH in certain conditions like polycystic ovary, people have very high LH levels in the case. It is not a very reliable uh, method of detecting ovulation in everybody. In a normal patient, person it is good, but PCOS patients, which we have in high numbers, it may be of limited value. And because of that, it's not re regularly used in everybody. Certain patients, we offer them. It can give false negatives, false positives in about 5 to 10 percent of the cycles, even in a normally ovulating person. Then we come to the transvaginal scanning which is really helpful because it can see you can show see the development of follicle from if you start from day 7 in IVF cycle we start from day 7 in normal comifene or letrozole induced cycles of uh, normal IU, IU assisted reproduction we start from day 10 or 12 and you can follow the growth of the follicle you can see how it behave, is behaving and you can predict the ovulation. And you can time your interventions like HCG trigger for ovulation based on the, the detection. And it progressively monitors the growth. And all your interventions can be timed. So it's the best uh, in the, with regard to the timing of intervention. So depending on your test results, whether it is basal body temperature or progesterone or transvaginal scanning, you can classify people into various types of anovulation, which is the commonest uh, category of people we treat. And it is the commonest uh, or the most uh, satisfactory category to treat as well, because anovulation can be tackled by various interventions which we have to a fairly satisfactory degree. So, WHO has classified an ovulation into three types. Type 1, where you have hypothalamic pituitary failure, you have high, uh, low uh, FSH and LH, and usually gonadotropins are less, you have low estrogens. Most of the time it is uh, due to systemic factors, chronic exercise, CV exercise, chronic illnesses or low body weight. So that is hypothalamic pituitary failure. Then you have the type 2 where you have normally functioning hypothalamic pituitary axis, but it is not regularly functioning. There's a dysfunction. We see most of them here with polycystic ovary syndrome. They are FSH is altered in different ratios, FSH low, LH is high, estradiol is again high, uh, but they don't ovulate, so there's a dysfunction, but it is functioning. In type 3, the yeah, ovary is not functioning at all. You have very high levels of gonadotropin, FSH, LH will be high, testosterone, uh, estrogens will be low, and most of them have what is called premature ovarian failure. 
So type 3 is what we don't really want to have. Type 1 and 2 is manageable. Type 2 is easily manageable. Type 1 might need some interventions. So depending on your classification, you can predict the outcomes of the patient. And uh, management we will talk about later. The other tests which we do uh, on female are the tubal patency. We have various choices. You can do HSGs or histokes, contrast, sono self-angiography, which we use saline or we have contrast medium cause uh, high cosy, which is a albumin or dextran preparation, which you can use to identify the cavity. So we can have laparoscopy and diatase or chromotubation. Remember, none of them, they establish the patency. We know that the tube has so many functions. It nurtures the sperm, it facilitates the fertilization, and then it enriches the zygote on its way for over one week until it reaches. So it has all these additional abilities which we cannot mimic. Just by doing the patency testing, it doesn't mean that you can establish the whole function of the tube. Even after tubal surgery, even if we establish the patency, that doesn't mean that the function is restored. So it's hit and miss. Some people are lucky to have everything restored after tubal surgery. Some people are not. So remember, function is different from the structure. Structurally, it may be normal. By a, these tests, we may be able to demonstrate, but functionally, it may not be. And what we uh, do as a tubal patient test depends on the background history. People with PEIT or pelvic surgery, usually we go for HSG. If the patient is having severe obesity, we don't like to do laparoscopy first. We go for low in, uh, interventional procedure. People with history of chlamydia or any other treatment, usually you need to do HSG. Whatever tubal patency test we do, it carries a risk of infection. So screen for chlamydia and other gentle infections and always give antibiotics. Cover them with chlamydia plus anaerobic infections. So generally we give azithromycin, metronidazole, doxycycline, metronidazole, uh, treatment for them. HSG or the histo self is the commonest thing which we do to assess tubal patency and people without any complicated pelvic history usually respond to that or are sent to that. We do it within the first 10 days of menstruation. Very high sensitivity in detecting distal tube defects which means the tubal, the fimbrial end of the tube but can give false positives to the proximal, 15%. So it's not a good uh, indicator of the proximal. Say corneal end blocks, sometimes even though it shows it's as a block, may be negative. So we need to do laparoscopic diet tests or hysteroscopic cannulation and other tests to confirm the block is there. And uh, it has a therapeutic uh, benefit as well. Because of the initially when we were using oil based uh, HSD contrast media, it helped and treated uh, some of the unexplained infertile patients. So, as a part of the treatment procedure, sometimes we repeat another HSD even after confirmation of uh, laparoscopic confirmation of tubal patency. Sometimes we offer them HSDs because it has some certain uh, therapeutic benefit. And HSG can give you an idea about the shape of the cavity. It doesn't exactly tell whether it is a fibroid or not, but still any impairment of the cavity can be detected. So people who have had fibroids or uh, vigorous curatages ending up with Asherman syndrome can be picked up. So this is a proximal tubal damage. This is a distal tubal block. Can be picked up with HSG. Histrosalphingography with contrast media or high is a similar one. Uh, you put a small catheter into the cervix and inject. You can see the cavity here and spillage of the contrast. So, very high sensitivity and specificity for 
uh, tubal patency. But uh, it may may compete with HSE. It's non-invasive, so but the contrast medium is expensive because of that. It's not picked up really well in everywhere, but uh, can be used, and you can only do it. Uh, transagenal scanning. So, it can be done as outpatient procedure easily. No radiation exposure like in HSG and no anesthesia like in laparoscopy. So, it is fairly good something which we need to be doing in the future. Laparoscopy is for people who have pelvic history of uh, complications, endometriosis, PEIDs, adhesions, pelvic surgeries and Usually, we can do it uh, in the first investigation part if the history is suggestive or later on, even after HSD and some treatment for infertility, we can go back to laparoscopy to identify whether there are after two or three cycles of uh, treatments or stimulation of ovulation. It is an invasive test, it is expensive. Risk of anesthesia is there, complications can happen. Bowel injury, blood vessel injury can even end up with death. Risk of infection is there. So, so many downsides of laparoscopy. But advantage is that it is therapeutic as well. Here you have the normal tubes, uterus and ovaries. You can see the hydrosalpics. And rather than coming back again, you can straight away treat them, drain the hydrosalpics. Endometriomas, you can drain them, take a sample, diatomize the deposits, all that can be done. So, it is very useful. Then we have uterine factor assessments, you have hysteroscopies, you have hysteroscopy is the best assessment of endometri uh, uterine factor, but sometimes because it is an invasive procedure, we do it uh, as a second line test. We usually do transvaginal ultrasound. When you are doing transvaginal ultrasound to improve the accuracy of picking endometrial cavity pathologies, you might use saline. You can infuse some saline through a feeding tube or special catheters are there, or even a small uh, gauge 6 Foley catheter. A pediatric Foley catheter can be inserted into the cervix and inject 5 to uh, 10 ml of. 37 degree body temperature saline. Do not put cold saline into cervix, you might end up causing a bradycardia and vagal shock to the female and she can even die. So, we have to give 37 degree centigrade body temperature saline, inject it slowly, you might see polyps, fibroids, everything. So, it has a fairly good accuracy as well. Hysteroscopy will will be the best. You can visualize and treat. Additional advantage of treating. Sometimes with fibroids and other pathologies, adenomyosis, we do ultrasound MRIs to identify abnormality. People with uterine structural malformations, obviously MRI is much better than scanning or laparoscopy. So, uh, with the 3D ultrasound, additional benefits of visualizing and imaging is there and in good hands it can even replace MRI to a certain extent. The diagnostic is also because it needs to be done, uh, can be done as outpatient, but if you really want to treat, you need to do it under GA uh, and risk of uterine perforation, infection is higher. So, you need to be careful. But always you can remove small submucous fibroids, polyps, adhesions, bands uh, can be treated in the same time. So, it has advantage of laparoscopy. Here is a saline sonohistrography where you have put saline, water is there and you can easily see the polyp in the cavity. So, it is very beneficial. So, if you have thick endometrium, think of, uh, we can always do saline. Then we come to ovarian reserve testing. So we do that uh, when the female is 35 years old. Tests which we do are basal FSH level on day 2, 3 years of the cycle or anti hormone. Antral follicle count is done 
So you need to have at least 10 or more antral follicles in a base day to three uh, scan of a female. Usually do it uh, when they are menstruating. Uh, but because of uh, usage of basal FSH and antimalarian hormone, now we don't do that uh, that much. Follicle counts. It's messy as said. None of these tests will really tell you whether you are going to conceive or not. It will only tell how many more viable eggs are there in the ovary. And uh, it gives us a good prediction to the outcomes of stimulation treatment. So it is, uh, if it is low, we, you can encourage the woman to go for pregnancy early. So people who are having, uh, thinking of having, raising a family later in life, better to get their ovarian reserve tested. Otherwise you will, when you try, you may, your bus may have gone. So without missing the bus, if you are going to delay your pregnancy, especially if you are going for higher studies or whatever, check your ovarian reserve. People with the family history of premature ovarian failure, anybody with a premature menopause or who has had such ovarian surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy to the pelvis in childhood, always do this ovarian reserve test. Basal FSH is the easiest test, though you do it on day three or of the cycle and if it is high, your ovarian reserve is poor. AMH doesn't have to be timed at any particular time. You can do it at any time because it comes from granulosa cells. Basically, granulosa cells covers the developing follicle. So if you have a fairly high granulosa cell number, your AMH is high. So your pre antral follicles count is good. If it is less obviously your preantral follicle number in your ovary is low so your ability to produce a baby is low so low AMH indicates poor result but there are downsides various uh, standards are there so there's no universal agreement on which standard to follow so there are various ways but still it is a very important uh, discovery of uh, giving a prognosis. Antral follicle count uh, can be counted. Generally, if it is less than 10, you have a reduced capacity. If it is less than 3 to 6, uh, your response to I even for ovulation stimulation with gonadotropin is poor. Anything about 12 is generally seen in polycystic ovary. They will have a very good outcome with ovarian stimulation. So when we are treating, uh, especially with advanced uh, reproductive, te assisted reproductive technologies, we do antral follicle count plus AMH level, which gives us a good idea about the response to IVF and other treatments. So that brings us to the end of this uh, second lecture. In the next one, we will talk about management uh, based on the, the things which we have learned uh, on the female investigations, management of the female partner as well as bit on the advanced technologies which are available for treating subvariety.